Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you on this uh, late spring morning. Um, I was smiling earlier because as I was waiting and, and watching um, the people uh, who are in the Zendo get set up, I was hearing the birds chirping, I think, uh, outside Gesho's window. Um, so I'm here and there at the same time through uh, the interconnectedness of, uh, of Zoom. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty magical. So the, the last time I think I gave a Dharma talk, I, uh, those of you who, who heard me speak, I was uh, uh, recovering from a viral infection. And, and um, uh, thank you to all of you who sent me a, a note. Um, I, I, it turns out I, I, I did not have Lyme's disease, um, but I did have another uh, tick-borne disease, which I was treated for, uh, called uh, anaplasmosis. And uh, I'm, as far as I know, I'm fine now. So it's that, uh, that is all. That is all behind me, but thank you all for for those who who sent your condolences. Uh, if I didn't get around to thanking you before, um, last time I was also speaking about um, uh, the Platform Sutra, um, and so I would like to actually continue um, doing that a little bit today, um, and to uh, return to uh, Huineng's teachings uh, there. So you, you may recall, um, Huineng was the sixth patriarch of our lineage. Um, he was a poor, uh, illiterate woodcutter from the south of China. And one day he heard a monk reciting the Diamond Sutra and left his home to study the Dharma. Um, despite his lack uh, of a formal education, um, Huineng displayed a deep understanding of the Dharma and he received transmission from the fifth patriarch. Um, but because he was not perceived by the, some of the monks to be deserving uh, of this honor, he had to flee the monastery with the robe and the bowl that were given to him. And later, uh, he spread the Dharma far and wide to people of all classes in ancient China. So he's a very, very important uh, figure in our, our Zen lineage. So last time I covered most of the uh, of part one of the uh, Platform Sutra, which is essentially um, uh, the story of how uh, Huineng came to be the sixth patriarch. Uh, part two contains um, uh, Huineng's teachings um, to uh, his his uh, assembly. Uh, and uh, if you take the time to to read the platform sutra, sutra, you will see that there are many of the elements of our, our Zen teachings are, are actually discussed in part two. So it's actually quite uh, interesting to see um, uh, how uh, far back um, the uh, things like the four vows and the three Buddhas um, uh, go in Zen teachings. Um, Huineng was lived in the um, uh, late seventh and early eighth centuries. So uh, it's it's a uh, the way I've been working with this. There, there, there are lots of of little sections, and I have been just taking uh, two or three sentences um, and and sort of working with them. And so that's what I'd like to do um, with you today. So this will be sort of uh, snippets of the Platform Sutra and, and a little bit of commentary. Um, for, for those who are interested, if you want to, to uh, read the Platform Sutra yourself, um, I'm using a translation by uh, a uh, scholar and Zen teacher named Red Pine. So the, the first little snippet is, this Dharma teaching of mine is based on meditation and wisdom. But don't think that meditation and wisdom are separate. Meditation and wisdom are of one, eff one essence, not two. So before speaking directly to this, I I'll tell a little story. Um, when I first encountered Zen, um, it was actually as a tourist uh, visiting temples in Japan and, and being moved by the beauty uh, and serenity of the architecture and the landscape of the old spaces. And after returning from Japan, I discovered a book on my shelf um, uh, called The Three Pillars of Zen uh, that was unread. Um, and so I read it. Uh, it's, uh, the three pillars are uh, morality, uh, meditation, and wisdom. So here in this little passage, um, Huineng emphasizes meditation and wisdom. He's emphasizing two of the three pillars of Zen. 
So at that time, uh, after reading Robert Aiken's book, I, uh, I tried meditation to see what it was all about. And I found that it was really difficult to meditate on my own. So I went looking for a Zendo. Now you could say that discovering temples in Japan was a coincidence, but was my response to their serenity uh, a, a coincidence? And, and why had I purchased this book um, many years before uh, and left it on my bookshelf? And why did I persist uh, when I found uh, meditation to be difficult? I'm not sure, but I knew that there was something. At, at that point in my life, um, uh, I was, I guess, in my 30s. Um, uh, I had stopped going to church, um, was happily married, uh, working a lot, but something was missing. Is it possible that meditation and wisdom were at work telling me, you need to do this? Ryoshin or Chuck, you need to do this. So Huineng is telling us we don't meditate to become wise. When there is meditation, there is wisdom and vice versa. Whatever it was that first brought you to this practice, whether it was a vague feeling of lack in your life or some strikingly clear recognition of impermanence or an event that caused you to question things that you had once had confidence in, whatever it was, the fact that you honored that feeling, came to a Zendo, sought a teacher, is your inherent wisdom at work, your inherent serenity, inner serenity, or search for inner serenity at work. When you're sitting in meditation, you're forced to confront the thoughts that arise. You're facing your thoughts, allowing them to arise, uh, not crowded out by the noise of our lives. So in this moment in meditation, there is your inherent wisdom. Whenever you catch yourself in a moment of reactivity or, or, and take a deep breath and refrain from unwholesome speech or action, is this meditation? Is it wisdom? So I'll read Huineng's verse again. This Dharma teaching of mine is based on meditation and wisdom. But don't think that meditation and wisdom are separate. Meditation and wisdom are of one essence, not two. The next little verse or snippet that I uh, focused on was this one. If the mouth speaks of goodness, but the mind doesn't think of goodness, meditation and wisdom aren't the same. But if good pervades both the mouth and the mind, if what is external and internal are alike, then meditation and wisdom are the same. Another way of saying this is purify your mind. Dogen teaches exactly the same thing. His, his teachings echo exactly the same thought when he says that practice and enlightenment are not two. There is no enlightenment without practice and no practice without enlightenment. If the mouth speaks of goodness, but the mind doesn't think of goodness, meditation and wisdom aren't the same. But if good pervades both the mouth and the mind, if what is external and internal are alike, then meditation and wisdom are the same. Huining goes on to say, one practice samadhi means at all times, whether walking, standing, sitting or lying down, practicing with a straightforward mind. A straightforward mind is the place of enlightenment. Don't practice hypocrisy with your mind while you talk about being straightforward with your mouth. So he's actually bringing in uh, morality here as well, the three pillars, morality, meditation, and wisdom. Um, uh, so after 
telling us to purify our mind, Huineng tells us to practice with a straightforward mind. And it's interesting, Red Pine says that Huineng doesn't tell us how to meditate at this point, because to do so would be separating meditation from this pure mind of ours. This pure mind that we already have is one practice samadhi. So what is a straightforward mind? I think it's a mind that is not attached to any dharma. What do I mean by this? Well, you know, we attach to things. We attach to ideas about who we are and about how the world works because of our delusion. We identify strongly with a separate self and we create a moat around it to, to protect it, to keep it safe, to keep it comfortable, to hold our fear at bay. We view the world through a lens of self-centered distortion. I know I do. A straightforward mind is simply being present with whatever's going on. He says, don't practice hypocrisy with your mind while you talk about being straightforward with your mouth. We carry so much baggage around with us. How often do you resist the moment, resist whatever's going on in your life? I don't want to be here. This is such a waste of time. Or I, I don't like so and so. They make me feel uncomfortable or they make me feel insecure. I've spent days developing strategies for how to get out of seeing someone or planning how to respond when I'm going when I actually do meet them. Uh, and then we get together and have a pleasant time. Or I, I'll hear someone say uh, something that is a little bit at odds with what I believe. And I, I immediately categorize them as one of those people. And I, I know we all do this. You know, I hear one thing and I automatically place an entire human being into a mental box in my mind. And I'm unwilling to look at them uh, as a whole human being um, and not as part of some tribe that is opposed to my tribe. A straightforward mind is a mind that is not viewing the world through this lens of self-centered distortion. Don't practice hypocrisy with your mind while you talk about being straightforward with your mouth. We're so concerned about appearances, we can't say one thing and do another and be straightforward. Similarly, we can't say one thing and think another. This is just being inauthentic. When our thoughts, our speech, and our actions are all in accord with the Dharma, this is practicing with a straightforward mind. Huinan goes on to say, deluded people cling to the external attributes of a teaching. Deluded people cling to the external attributes of a teaching. They think that sitting motionless, eliminating delusions and not thinking thoughts are one practice samadhi. samadhi. But this is a lifeless dharma. The dharma must flow freely. Why block it up? I love that. Why block it up? So tell me, sitting motionless, eliminating delusions and not thinking thoughts. Isn't that what we do here? Huineng says no. Sitting motionless and not having any thoughts, that's, that's dead Zen, that's lifeless Zen. These attributes might characterize a rock more than a human being, not an actual mind flowing freely in response to circumstances. Now, of course, when we first start to sit in meditation, we, we, we use concentration practices like counting our breath or following our breath to slow the endless stream of thoughts in our mind enough that we can actually start to notice them. And if we put in enough effort, we may discover moments when there is a gap between our thoughts. But as long as you are alive, as long as I am alive, 
thoughts will arise. And with these thoughts, reality is born in all its many forms. We chant, Nen Nen arises from mind. Nen Nen is not separate from mind. So I don't know if, if, uh, if you've ever had uh, one of the teachers translate the word uh, Nen for you, but um, uh, the translation I, I use um, is, uh, is thought moment or, or thought instant, uh, or present mind is another translation. Uh, and if you look up the kanji for Nen, uh, the top part uh, of the kanji uh, means now, uh, and the bottom part of the kanji uh, uh, the top part is ima, uh, and the bottom part is kokoro, uh, which refers to heart mind. So nen is the now heart mind, a thought instant, just an instant of thought, which is immediately followed by another instant of thought. It's the present moment, the continuously arising present moment. So Huineng says that a straightforward mind is a mind that's not attached, it's not stuck, it flows freely, it's alive. When a sad thing happens, we're sad. When a happy thing happens, we're happy. When we experience pain, as one of our Sangha members mentioned uh, on our mailing list this week, we struggle with that pain. And with our practice, we may be able to experience our pain without adding anything extra. We, we may be able to just notice, yes, this is pain. Um, it's here now, uh, but not make it something special. Now I could get poetic and say a straightforward mind is the mind of Avalokiteshvara that hears the sounds of the world. It's the mind of Sabantabhadra riding his white elephant, uh, vowing to practice to save all sentient beings. But Huineng is much more down to earth. He says, it's your mind right now. It's my mind right now, creating the world in each and every moment. Huineng's teaching was radical. He hadn't lived his life as a scholar monk studying the sutras. He was an illiterate woodcutter whose heart was touched by hearing the Diamond Sutra. And he went on to embody the teachings and brought them down to earth so that we can all start to live them ourselves. And the last little phrase uh, that I wanted to touch on was know your mind and see your nature. Know your mind and see your nature. Red Pine says that this is the core of Huineng's teaching. What does it mean to know your own mind? In Red Pine's commentary, he says that when Huineng uses the word mind here, uh, he's not referring to our discriminating mind. Our discriminating mind is the mind that experiences the world through sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, and thought. And, that, and then it develops views or concepts about the world. It's our ordinary mind. It's the mind that tells us this is a cat and that's a dog. Well, and the mind that knows, well, look both ways before you cross the street. It's the mind that tells us, I don't like so-and-so because he's such a jerk. It's the mind that carries our karma. Here, Huineng is referring to our true mind, the mirror mind of awareness. This is the mind that gives rise to reality, to all dharmas, to all thoughts. It's wild and completely untamed. It's like a ball being carried on a flowing stream. It doesn't attach to anything. It's the mind of peace, because this mind doesn't know inside or outside, self or other. Actually, this mind is not separate from our ordinary discriminating mind. It notices when we attach. 
And just as in our meditation practice, it's the mind that returns to the breath, that returns to one. You may remember this poem that Huineng wrote on the wall uh, before he became the fifth patriarch, the sixth patriarch rather. He wrote, the mind is the Bodhi tree, the body is the mirror stand. The mirror itself is so clean, dust has no place to land. The mind, and I, this is what I said last time, I said the mind is the seat of wisdom, the body is the stand that holds it. The mirror is originally pure, there is nothing that can be defiled. This is the fundamental teaching of the Platform Sutra. We are all Buddhas. Our minds are filled with delusion, we don't see it. When our minds are free of attachments, we see it. When we let go of our attachment to a separate self, the mystery is revealed. In Huineng's non-dualistic teaching, our mind is the source of all things, and our nature is the mind in action. When our mind gives rise to deluded thoughts, we cause suffering. When our mind is free of, our, of deluded thoughts, we manifest our true, true nature. Huineng's teaching is that we don't need to look for Buddha outside ourselves. He teaches us to see the three-bodied Buddha arising from our very nature. Meditation and wisdom. Practicing with a straightforward mind, that mind that flows freely. Knowing this mind and seeing this nature and taking refuge in the Buddha within our own material body. These are Huineng's teachings. Thank you for your practice.